and you have, for example, a shoulder. But because it is going to be distributed almost everywhere in your body, uh, it might also have side effects, for example, in your head, headaches, or problems in your digestion. And so what pharmaceutical companies or chemists or biologists try to do is really to make drugs that do exactly what they want at the place they want, so here, and there, and there, and at the time they want. Uh, and that we, that, I mean that they're effective, so that we don't have to take one kilogram of the drug, but just like 50 milligrams, right? Like a small pill. And uh, that it's easy to be delivered. So ideally, that we can take that by like orally and not by injection or anything else. Think about insulin, like if you have to do daily injections, that's quite nice. So now comes photopharmacology into play. Imagine you have a problem here in the shoulder, and this is just conceptual. Uh, you take a medication, but the medication is off, so it's not active when you take it. You take it, it goes to, it distributes everywhere in the body, but also at the place where it's actually needed. And now you take a flashlight or a lamp, shine light, and you locally activate the drug. The drug is then activated, cures the problem, ideally, and then over time deactivates itself, gets metabolized so that's like digested and then gets excreted and goes out of the body as often. And that's in a nutshell what photopharmacology is and what we're aiming for. And so the talk today is going to be about this really, I'm trying to make, help you understand how photopharmacology works, because I think the principle is pretty easy, but like how does it really work on, a, on the fundamental level? And so we first will look into how does medication work, so we understand in that part. Second, we will look into light and where we can learn from biology, how biology interacts with light, and whether we can use that for photopharmacology. As a third part, we will then look into actually how we make these drugs and how we can then switch on and off these drugs with light. And that's the term called focus. And so that will be the first part. Medicare. How does medication work? Medication usually targets either an enzyme or a receptor. I've just made a little schematic for both of them. And uh, what you will find out, or what we talk about extensively, is that these are like big molecules in our bodies that have these little pockets. And these pockets are going to be very important. Receptors, we can think of, for example, smelling the nose. We have tons of receptors in our nose uh, where we have molecules, for example, from the flower, the scent molecules that go into our nose and then go to the receptor, to this molecule here, and bind in this pocket, in this cavity. And this pocket you can really imagine as like a little cavity. It's really literally a, like a geometrical shape where something actually fits into. And so the molecule binds, activates the receptor, and the receptor then tells the cell or later the brain, oh, I just smell, or like detected this and this scent, and then we recognize that we actually smell in roses. Similar to that, uh, enzymes. They don't tell our body necessarily that they detect something, but they actually are our um, machines to eat and digest food or stuff, or to build up new stuff. So you could imagine uh, eating bread. Enzymes are responsible, uh, responsible for actually breaking down the bread into pieces that then can be taken up by the cells. And so there are workhorses 
for almost all process in our body. And so you can imagine that if something goes wrong with an enzyme, we run into problems. And so we start having diseases. And that why, that's why it makes sense to make drug molecules that either target receptors or enzymes. Now, how does an enzyme work? Very simple. We have that's a, our enzyme. It has this cavity again where molecules can go into a dock. And once they are in place, the enzyme can connect them to a new molecule and release them. So very simple. You can also do it the other way around, for example, for digestion. One molecule comes in, it's broken up, and the two pieces leave again. Okay. Here so far. Now, what is really important is to understand that the geometry of both the molecules and the pocket, the binding pocket or cavity, uh, is really, really important. Only certain molecules will fit into this pocket and others will not fit. So if you have molecules that don't fit, you'll not, you'll not be able to actually make a new molecule, for example, or break it down in that way. However, while geometry is extremely important, we have a bit of geometrical freedom on certain edges of the pocket, right? For example, where, where it comes in, yeah, at the top here, you have a bit of freedom, so you can put some, like you have this wiggle space, and so the enzyme can still do its job, even though this molecule is slightly different from what we see before. And so how does it relate to medication? So drug companies make molecules that look like these molecules, thus fit into the enzyme, into this pocket, and can therefore block the enzyme for doing its job. Just by geometry. So a drug has a certain geometry, which is designed to exactly fit into the enzyme. By doing so, it blocks the enzyme and stops the enzyme from doing its job. Importantly, and that's the reason why we have side effects of drugs, is because of the shape of the drug, and there are many, many thousand different enzymes in our bodies, it can happen that uh, an enzyme, like a drug, can fit in more than one enzyme and thus affect different enzymes and different functions in our bodies and thus mess with our other processes, not just the processes that it takes. An example to illustrate that is phenylketonuria. Have you ever heard of that? Sorry, it is. Genetic disease. Uh, that is detected mostly in newborns because that's where it's relevant. And it's the inability to break down this molecule, phenylketonuria, which is an essential amino acid and comes in many foods or like produce that we eat on a daily basis. So you can find it in breast milk, so babies, uh, soybeans, chicken, and eggs. And, milk. and the problems. Uh, people with this, this condition have is they cannot break this molecule down because they simply lack the enzyme. Right? And so what you have to do to address that is and just you have to reduce the, the uptake of this uh, amino acid and that then allows these people to live more, more life. If you don't do that, the problem is actually this the new uh, aniline gets accumulated in the body to toxic levels and can then cause intellectual disability seizures or if in the case of the mother, birth defects. So this is a very simple and very clear example and that's why I chose it because it's genetic mutation so it really affects only one enzyme and so it's very easy to see oh this enzyme doesn't work, so that's why you have this certain condition and this certain disease. It is really just to illustrate 
that diseases can be traced back to enzymes and receptors, but for pain medication or for anti-cancer treatments, of course, the picture is much more complicated and you have to take into account more than one enzyme. Yeah. Great. So just to picture that as well, so you have the enzyme, you have phenylalanine, comes in, binds to the enzyme, the enzyme breaks it down and releases but if the person lacks the genetic information or is not able to make this enzyme, you will also not be able to break down the phenylalanine, and that's why you can accumulate this stuff in the body when you keep eating it, and that's why you have this bad enzyme, or this bad effect. Now, to another medically relevant example, is who has heard of beta blockers? So you know what they do? They're used to treat the problems with your heart, especially they supposed to suppress the second heart attack, if you had one before. And so what they really model that, and this is just a molecular structure, and I hope you can see the blue part here and here, it really resembles, and that's what it's made to, molecule called adrenaline, and you know very well what adrenaline does. For example, if you're sitting on the roller coaster, you get an adrenaline rush, your heart rate goes up because of this molecule. So the job of adrenaline is really to tell or regulate, among others, heart rate. And part of why beta blockers are effective is because they actually talk to the same or fit into the same receptors right? for geometrical reasons. Another example which is currently of high importance in the US particularly is the opioid crisis. And I, I, every time I look at this slide myself, I'm pretty much amazed because so what we have on the left is morphine, one of the active compounds in uh, opium. So that you can isolate from poppy seeds, and you know yourself that's sort of addictive. Uh, if you then compare it to heroin, the drug, you see it's basically identical. Genetically speaking, uh, oxycontin, oxycodone, is a commonly prescribed painkiller after surgeries that is causing the problem of the opioid crisis in the US and others, and. Surprise, surprise, it's almost identical. And so it's not really a surprise that, I mean, it kills, uh, I mean, not kills, <laughs> well, it also kills, but it, uh, it is a uh, painkiller because it acts on the same enzyme or receptor as morphine does. And morphine is a very potent painkiller, but it is also extremely addictive. This here, codeine, is usually used in a coughing syrup, and that's why you also not take too much coughing syrup, because it can be addictive. So to summarize that, is, uh, many diseases are caused by receptors or by malfunctioning enzymes, and what we really do as researchers and pharmaceutical companies is make molecules that fit into these pockets of these enzymes and receptors, thereby blocking them and uh, stopping the disease or certain bad effects from happening. And what is really important for you to take away is that the geometry of both the pocket of the enzyme and of the molecule is really, really important. Yeah. So that is sums up the first part of photopharmacology, where we now understand that the geometry of a drug is really, really important. And where we basically heading to is the idea that we actually use light to change the geometry of a drug. And then it doesn't fit into the enzyme or receptor anymore, and that's how we can turn off or on a drug. Right? So, idea by using light, you can change the geometry of the drug, 
And in one case, it doesn't fit, whereas in the other case, it fits very well, and therefore can do its job. With that, uh, we have time for the questions. Is there anything on here so far? All here? Great. Now, uh, second part, biology and life. So we now know or understand that uh, enzymes and receptors are important for diseases and that drugs fit into these pockets through their geometry. But now we have to understand how does light factor in, like how is it possible to use light to actually change the geometry of a molecule and can you actually are there examples in biology itself where we can take and learn from? And it turns out to be the case. But before that, I would really like to make the case that light actually can do work. And that's intuitively clear because you've been having some work scroll yourself at some point that shows you that light can be pretty energy rich. You can also use them for solar panels. And in this Crookes radiometer, it's a little video, it should play, yes, where you use light to actually make this rotor here turn. How it works is this is just a ball with a vacuum, and this rotor has four blades with a white and a black side, and by shining light, you can actually heat up the black side and thus make this rotor turn which I think is quite a neat uh, example that actually light can be used to really do mechanical work. So if we then think about light, light comes in waves and also particles, and how we can define a wave, like the wave or the wave uh, light is actually, if you look at the two peaks of a wave, from one wave to the other one, you can define a wavelength, or just the distance between the two peaks of the waves. And by changing this distance, we can strongly change the properties of light. If you go very, very small, and you probably know that already, we end up with x-rays that are used in the clinics to get x-ray pictures. If we then go a bit longer into the nanometer range, and we go to UV light, that causes sunburns. Uh, if we go a bit longer, we go to the visible region that actually our eyes can detect. And even further, we go to infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. For radio waves, the wavelength is in the meters to kilometer range, whereas for X ray, we really go below. Nanometers, so 10 to the minus, so 1 billion of that meter. And what is really important to understand is that if you change the wavelength, you're also changing the energy of the, of the radiation. So that's why this is really bad, this is really dangerous, that's why you have to wear the lead protection if you take an x-ray in, in the hospital, because you don't want to have any damage in the other parts of your body, especially not in your reproductive organs. And radio waves are everywhere nowadays, and they're much less harmful than UV light or X ray. Medically, uh, very relevant are infrared, visible light, and ultraviolet, and we will discuss why. Part of the reason why is it turns out that. Depending on the wavelength of the light, so of the, like the distance between the two peaks of the waves, uh, light interacts differently with materials or matter. For X-rays, the reason why X-rays are so dangerous is because this light is so strong that it can actually kick out electrons from weapons. And that can then lead to defects that causes harm in our bodies. Uh, UV light actually wor works on our on the molecules itself and can break bonds within the molecule. 
And uh, that's, for example, what happens in sunburns, right? The UV light just damages the molecules in the outer layers of the skin, and that's why you get red because the cells have to deal with the broken down molecules. And maybe you've ever wondered how sunscreen works. The sunscreen is just basically molecules that get breaking down, broken down instead of the skin. Right? So we're not blocking the light, but we're just basically giving the light a layer of molecules that get broken down instead of our skin. Which is why that it needs to be reapplied. Exactly, yes, exactly, yes. And by the, the strength of the like SPF 50 or SPF 15, right? The higher you go, the more molecules are here. So, yeah. Uh, if we then go to infrared, uh, we're not breaking bonds anymore because we don't have enough energy to do that. But we're actually making the molecules start vibrating. And if you then go to microwaves, the molecules don't vibrate anymore, but they start rotating. And that's how microwaves work. But what you actually do with microwaves in our normal microwave ovens is you make water molecules start turning very, very, very fast. And because of this fast movement, you heat up the, the food. And, and that's how yeah, that's how we heat our food. And I think I always find it very neat to just look at this different wavelength and on the, trying to understand how they interact with the uh, molecules, and that can be used to explain quantum bonds. So that also foreshadows already a topic for photopharmacology because obviously you cannot use microwaves for photopharmacology because you don't want to boil the patient. <laughs> <laughs> so, I hear it. And uh, you also don't want to use x-ray because that's very useful and might damage the patient instead of helping. And so that's what I already mentioned before is if you look at the energy, it's inversely related to the wavelength. So the longer the wavelength, the, the smaller the energy. So infrared has very low energy and low wavelength, where UV light has higher energy and a shorter energy. Great. So, how does biology factor in? So, remember again, we're looking for a way to use light, and we know how light can actually break molecules or make them opaque or like turn or whatever, uh, and to change the geometry of a drug. And it turns out that our very own own eyes actually have evolved to do exactly what we want to do. And this is uh, a schematic representation of our eye where you have light coming in through the lens and at the back of our eye we have the retina that its job is to detect light, right, to detect the picture and then that gets bundled and goes through the brain if you look at this retina, it's built up, it's built up from cells that are, its only job is to actually detect light. The cone cells are for color, the rod cells are just for black white see. And uh, if we then zoom in into the rods in this upper part here, we have stacks of structures that have a very spe special uh, enzyme or protein here, this the blue or purple ones, uh, which are so called opsins, and they have a single molecule in there which is called photopigment or retinol. Now, the special case about retinol is that it's a molecule which is, has a kink like it's bent, and what happens is when you shine light on this bent molecule, it changes its structure to go straight. And the only job of the protein of this, this purple bit here is to actually sense this change from bent to linear. And once, so light hits this molecule, it gets linear. The opsin uh, senses that, 
So it tells the cell, and the cell then tells it. Uh, that's really cool. Uh, you can already guess what kind of flight you have to use for that. It has to be in the visible region, right? Because if it's too energy rich, we break down the molecule. If it's not energy rich enough, for example, microwave or IR, then we actually just make it vibrate or rotate. And that's why humans see visible light, right? And not IR and not UV and not X ray. Uh, now, I've only told you a part of the story because just imagine now we now can go from bent to linear. But that would actually mean that you can only take one picture. Okay. And so we have to somehow go back from the linear to the bent state again, otherwise you cannot have the continuous vision that we had. And it turns out that the body has an elaborate mechanism to do that, and so it has an enzyme. And what happens is, so you have the bent state, you have light, it goes to the linear state, the linear molecule gets taken out of the protein of the oxy, and then a dedicated enzyme makes it bent again and inserts it back into the oxy. So we can start over again. And that's, for example, why it takes a moment for our eyes to get used to, like when you go from bright to dark, that's why it takes some time to get used to the new conditions again. Just because it takes a moment until the linear ones are back to the pencil. Right? And with that, we come to a very interesting research tool, so called optogenetics. Has anyone ever heard of optogenetics? It's, uh, and, uh, I would say, in the last five to ten years, maybe, and has really changed uh, neuroscience and also. A lot of biological research, and what researchers do is just very simple. They take this this system here and make it uh, basically put it into brain cells. And what happens then is that if you have this system in brain cells, you can use light to turn on brain cells, like some neurons. So if you shine light, neurons start firing. And by using genetics, so by changing the DNA of, the, of organisms, for example, of mice, you can target very specific neurons, for example, neurons that are responsible for language, or for maybe not mice, but, but like for certain behaviors, and you can really switch on or off uh, behaviors in organisms. And this is an example, I hope you can Maybe turn down the lights a bit. Uh, maybe here. Yes. So what we have here is, is just a YouTube video. We have a mouse with food, cheese. Uh, the skull has been opened. Uh, blue LED or laser like fiber optics has been implanted on the brain. And so what is going to happen is they target neurons that are responsible for uh, hunger. And so once they switch on the light, the mouse will start eating. Once they switch off the light, the mouse will stop eating. So it's quite uh, crazy, I would say. So light is on, eating. Lights off. Not interested anymore. Light on. Start seating again. It's pretty crazy, right? Now, this is of course purely for actually trying to understand the job of certain neurons, right? So, I'm not sure I'm going to make crazy minds, but they really just try to understand what, how our brain works. 
And the problem with, uh, so this is an amazing tool, but the problem is you actually have to genetically change the organism. Sorry. And that's very difficult with humans. And so that's not necessarily the way to go, but this would certainly be a way, if you could find a way to not use genetic manipulation, to actually make healthcare better. And so that's the idea of the problem. So really use drugs to do the same as optogenetics, but then without the need for actually genetically modifying patients. And so to sum that up, uh, we've seen that light can do work depending on the wavelength, so on the color and the energy, it can interact with molecules in different ways, and only certain ways are helpful for us, namely the ones, the energy where we can just change the molecular geometry, but not like break it down. And uh, we actually have developed in our eyes, eyes a very strong mechanism to do that exactly. And uh, we can learn from that for optogenetics, but not for also for And yeah. Yeah. So with that, we have the second part. So we understand that geometry is important. We now understand that hey, biology already has evolved the way to actually change the structure of the geometry of the molecule, and that is used for our vision. And now we just really have to understand how we can mimic that in our research to do exactly what the eyes do. Eyes do. And with that. So, are there any questions? And we can also have a bit of fun to vibrate ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, certain animals can see UV light, for example. Do they have different rods and cones that are more robust and don't get broken by? Uh, I think so. So, uh, that's a very good question. So it turns out like UV has a certain like range. So going from hard UV to like soft UV. So probably they can see like let's say 360 to 400 nanometers, which is like barely visible for us. So it's not as detrimental as for example 200 nanometers, which really then breaks down molecules. And so sometimes you read like like now the UV light from the sun is very strong today and has a lot of hard UV, right? That's then what causes the harm, but like, so there's like more harmful UV and less harmful UV. But what you're actually hinting at is a very good question because if you think about how we can see color, it's actually the same, it's the same molecule, but the protein is slightly different, and that changes which light the molecule can detect. And so, uh, we have red, green, and blue like detection, and that's just by the, the shape of the protein. Uh, actually, plants have the same, like it's called photoperiodism. Uh, they can also detect UV light, actually, and also sometimes red light. And so that works exactly the same as you just talking about, just with slightly different molecules. Yeah. What is what is the purpose of the max detecting? Uh, so broadly speaking, there's two effects. Like one is, for example, for algae to like to arrange and go towards light, and the other one is have you heard of circadian rhythms, like so day and night cycles, and so. We have to, but also plants have to kind of calibrate them, and so they use this 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 machinery basically to calibrate that. That is. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sure. Sure. Put a dopsin into a uh, neuron yeah. and cause it. First. How do you put it in there? And where in the neuron does it go? I mean, inside the neuron, where it's set that it was set that it can have that effect. Also, that can turn the neuron on off. Yeah, so actually, exactly. So, oh, that's a good question. So, uh, we just talked about bacteria. And so, what researchers take, they, they go to the bacteria, take the gene 
That means we call like a cheat that you are responsible for that machinery and copy paste it into uh, cells of, for example, mice. Uh, and then only the neurons they want. And so the, the neurons make this the toxins or these proteins and molecules themselves because they have the genes now and they then automatically put this the toxins into their like out the membranes. Right, so let's say the rhodopsin is there and it reacts to light. How does that turn the neuron on and off? What else is it talking? It must be something else going on in there. Yeah. Uh, what is your uh, background? Like, I have a degree in biochemistry. Okay, yeah, so uh, I'm just looking for. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Talk is here. I can, I'm happy to. Uh, so, how you observe is that you have like, so here you have the neuron, and so you have like a membrane, and this is in, and this is out. And so what happens is you have a you build up a potential, like basically a difference in electrical potential, because you have a certain salts here and certain salts here. And how a neuron fibers is actually has little like gates that can be opened or closed. And once they open, it can flow in and uh, Basically, the difference between the two salt concentrations breaks down. And that basically then creates a signal that then can transport. And now, what happens with the uh, toxins is, I'm just now drawing it very simply, is when light hits the molecule, it gets linear, and this protein changes in such a way that it tells. The next channels next to it basically to open up and you basically start this escape. Does that make sense? Yeah, how does the toxin get into that part of the cell? Yeah, the neuron makes it the toxin somewhere. Yeah. And how does it get to the membrane? Uh, good question. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, probably, so researchers are not only just copying the rhodopsin. But they, of course, copy more genes that are also responsible for actually then bring it to the, to the membrane and, and make the molecules and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, come back in three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. 
Before you guys go, it'd be great if you could fill out our survey. We have one question up here, pretty important. What topics would you like to have in future lecture series? So if there's anything you really want to learn about, let us know and we try really hard to get students to get down those topics. So yeah. Okay. Welcome back. Actually, we really want to we just talked about it, but maybe it's also interesting for the others. So uh, retinol that we just looked at uh, is almost identical to vitamin A, and uh, vitamin A can be found within, for example, carrots. That's why you should be. That's why people say you should eat carrots with rice. Um, the molecules have to interact with light, right? And uh, that makes them colored, so that's also one reason why, for example, carrots are orange. Let's talk now about photoswitches, so the last part. We've now already learned that the geometry is important, and we've looked at how light and biology kind of work together. And now the last part is, how can we actually mimic this retinol and this stuff with because by training, I'm a chemist, so I'm a chemist, so I make molecules. And so, how can I actually use what we just learned for photopharmacology? And so, if we think about light in a more broad perspective, light is just really an ideal way to control stuff. Because it's cheap, we can turn it on and off when we want, we can change the color really easily. Uh, we can change the intensity very easily, and if you have the right type of light, it's also not very important. And that's why a lot of people in research use it for materials, for chemistry, to actually switch on and off reactions, but also in biology to do certain things. And certain things is, they're already two methodologies that are widely employed. One is photodynamic therapy that has been in the clinics for one or two decades now. Uh, one is on caging, which is extremely often used in biological research. And the last part are photo switches for photopharmacology. Uh, is anyone familiar with uh, photodynamic therapy? So what you can actually see in this picture is this is a patient, this is a hand of a, or two hands of a surgeon, and uh, you have red light coming through this fiber delivered into the body of the patient through a small cut here. And uh, so a bit bigger is, uh, so it's already used in the clinics. It has three components, red light, a drug, which is called a photosensitizer, and we also need oxygen just from the air, and that is in the tissue surrounding it. And what happens is that light activates the drug. The drug takes any oxygen that is surrounding it and turns it from good oxygen into very bad oxygen. It turns out that the oxygen that we need and breathe every single moment in our lives 
actually also exists in a different form, which can be very bad for cells. And uh, maybe you've heard of antioxidants. So antioxidants, one of their jobs is actually to counteract so-called react reactive oxygen species, so ROS. And ROS are one is basically generated here by using light. So we use this light and this molecule to locally make very, very bad, very, very reactive oxygen that basically goes rogue and kills everything that is immediately surrounding it. And this is cool because we can just use light, which we can precisely define exactly to one position, and then we can use to use that to kill all the cells around it. And that's used for uh, for acne, for example, but also for cancer. There, yeah. Is it also used in um, dentistry? Uh, I don't. I'm not sure whether photodynamic therapy is using dentistry. Dentistry. Well, <coughs> uh, what you use in dentistry is you use UV light mm -hmm. to uh, harden the polymers, like so. So to make uh, plastic in your teeth or yeah. So no. So also use that. Yeah, that's a good, good example actually. Yeah. And so the idea really here is to use light, which is minimally invasive and can still do something very effective. The second part is so called rock caging. And what you can really think of like you have like a bad actor, like a, a, talk, like a poison or like a very active drug. And it's caged, so it doesn't do anything. And once you shine light, uh, you free the lion or the drug, and it can do its job. So how that looks chemically is really that so you have the drug, and this drug has almost like a hat, like uh, something that changes its structure, and so the drug with the hat doesn't fit into the enzyme. But once you shine light on, it cleaves this like it kicks off the hat. The drug is free and can bind and do its job. This is really convenient because just with using light, we can actually switch on molecules. And in biology, this is used very often to just in cells, like for example, in a single cell, we can shine light and we can activate a certain drug and can just follow what happens over time under the microscope. Which is super convenient because you can just define now we switch it on and then you can just have the time stamp basically. The problem though is that removing this hat makes the hat still stick around, right? So and the hat can be toxic and can do as basically its own life, and that's not something that we want in the patient because it can actually harm the patient. And another part is that yes, there is a way to actually activate the drug, but it cannot go back. And so we really have to think about a way where we don't have a toxic, like something bad, being produced when we activate the drug, and also something, a way to act that we can actually go from the activated drug back to the inactivated drug. And you guess they already the answer our photo switches. Photo switches, as we've seen for retinol, exist in two states, state A and state B. And we can use light of different color to go from state A to B and then from state B back to A. Now, when we looked at retinol, we, for example, green light was used to go from state A to B and then there was an enzyme that brought it back. That has something to do with how the structure looks like. But the most photo switches that we have in the lab can actually be toggle back and forth with different colors of light. And what happens when we go from state A to B and B back to A is we really change the geometry, but also other properties like the charge and all that stuff that is important. So we talked about that, and so we really want to do this with a molecule that looks similar, but slightly different. So that we can actually make it in the lab and that we don't have to go all risk carrots 
Uh, one such molecule is called azobenzene. Azobenzenes are very often used, and you've probably encountered quite a few of them already today. Uh, they're used as food colorants. They're sometimes used for the very brightly orange uh, sodas that you can buy in the supermarket. Some of them are used for in Europe for the, you know, the markings on the streets, like the yellow markings. And yeah, they've actually been in the first antibiotic, that, oh, sorry, the second antibiotic that was approved right after the World War. And so they've been with us for a long time, but only a certain group of them actually can switch back and forth. And so we go in this case from a linear state, use UV light, go to a thin state, and then we can use blue light to go back. Now, that probably makes intuitively sense to you, like if you go from the linear state to the thin state, which state is more stable? The linear or the thin? The linear, right? Because here you actually kind of have like push into each other and it's just not so nice. So what happens is that over time we can go from the bent state back to the linear state. And so chemists can actually tune how long it takes going from the bent back to the linear. And so we can tune that from milliseconds to years. And you can already imagine that depending on the disease or thing that you want to address, the times going back from here to here will actually matter a lot. For example, if you want to make a molecule that is used for vision, you don't want to have a year going back, right? Because then you have one picture per year. So you want to have milliseconds. And so that these are this kind of like things we think about on a daily basis in the lab. And this is just the representative example of the different photo switches that have been developed in, let's say, the last 50 years or so. Uh, you don't have to really know all the structures per se, but what I really want to point out is that we have certain, like many different type of molecules, that they all exist in two states, and if you look at them, like broadly speaking, this is linear to bent, this is bent to bent, or it's basically just bending. Uh, this is actually closing and opening a ring. This is also closing and opening a ring. This is closing and opening a ring, and this one's also closing. So these different molecules will have very different geometries. And so if you want to make drugs with a certain geometry that it fits into an enzyme, we can choose different photoswitches and cloud purposes. So you can really think of this as a toolbox that you can go back to and use the tool that you want for your own purposes. And guess what? Photoswitches are really useful. Uh, we know them in our daily lives from the self parking glasses. You've seen that probably? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, they actually have a uh, coding with photos in there. That, that uh, when light hits, they turn darker. Uh, 2016 was the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for Molecular Machines, which is the idea that you make, make mechanical machines, but they're just very, very tiny, like in like single molecule level. And uh, uh, we use uh, uh, photo switches for that, among others, because they you can imagine they can do work, right? Because if you go linear to bent, they can actually move stuff. And uh, people also use it for computer chips, where you think, like, because right now we're limited in the size of the computer chips. And so if you then go to a really single molecule computing, that would give you a lot of space. Yeah, so we really can use and think about these photo switches as a tool to actually switch on and off something and to do like 
mechanical work. So, and so to summarize a bit, they change the shape or geometry when you shine light of different color. They can go back from state E back to state I via time. And uh, yeah, different photo switches exist. And so we have like a wonderful toolbox that you can use for other purposes. So you now understand geometry is important, light and biology, how we interact with each other, and that we can use photo switches as a toolbox that they can auto inactivate over time. And so now we have the basic understanding that we need to actually go to photopharmacology. And so photopharmacology. Just to reiterate it again, is we take a drug that is off, it distributes all over the body, but it doesn't do anything because it's off, because geometrically it doesn't fit into the enzymes. We then use light to actually only switch it on where we need it, and then over time, it, uh, when it has done its job, it switches itself off and gets excreted by the body. Now, when it gets out of the body, it already is in your state. So you can already think that would be helpful, for example, to fight against antimicrobial resistance. Because the problem there is that we accumulate active antibiotics in the environment. And um, yeah, actually, what's this excrete though? It goes out until the world would be could it be activated by light again? Is this out? Uh, yeah, so that's a very good point. It depends, of course, very, very badly rates and uh, depends uh, what kind. So you would have to, to make the drug in a certain color of light, right? That it, uh, like, so you have to think of a way then that it only gets activated in your body with a certain wavelength, but then, for example, in a wavelength that is not so much out there in the environment. First example of photopharmacology is quite obvious, is a uh, vision restoration. It's quite obvious because we actually there's retinal in our eyes that does this job. But uh, in certain diseases, retinal cannot be produced, or these cells like homes and drops actually degenerate, like, like die, and so people are blind. And so there's been quite a lot of research in the last five to ten years mice so they try to make blind mice see again and first tests actually are really promising they can inject these photo switches into the into the eye image so and the by, basically bypassing uh, the, the relay from the opsins like from retinal to the brain but then directly just activating neurons in the eye by making molecules that Go activate this this proteins, these channels themselves. And so yeah, so there really there are examples out there where they can make get basic black and white in that particular situation. And here, as I mentioned, you want to have photo switches that have milliseconds going back because otherwise we don't have continuous. Uh, coming to the antibiotics, this was a paper from our group from 2013. This is just a very basic proof of principle that uh, there's a very often used antibiotic called cytotoxicin. Potentially, people have already used it yourself. Uh, what you see, so this part is the act active part, and this part is actually the room where we have a bit of room. Or wiggle or for like a little bit of space. And so what we can do is we can put an azabenzene in this space. And uh, this was the first time something like that had been done. And so it received quite a bit of attention. And it turns out that in the linear state, the antibiotic is off. And when you shine UV light, the antibiotic is on. And in that case, it turned out that it takes two hours to go back. And uh, what people then did was they, so this is a paper dish with uh, bacterial cultures here. So they can grow bacteria in a plate. And so what they would do is they take the antibiotic, which is off, 
put it into the medium that is used for growing the bacteria. And then they take a photo mask, uh, shine light through the photo mask onto the plate. And only where light actually gets through, the antibiotic gets activated. And everywhere else it's still off. And so what you can see actually is that it's only off. Uh, only where it goes off, bacteria can grow, and everywhere else, bacteria don't grow. Which I think is an extremely cool example of how spatially controlled you can actually like do this switch. The other point that was kind of cool about this application was that because it can go back from here to here, is uh, like as I said, the antibiotic switches itself. Mentioned the uh, problem that this also not outside, and that's definitely a problem, and that's something one would have to think a bit about more carefully. But uh, this was just a proof of concept to show that hey, we can we can actually really make bacteria grow or not grow in a very specific. Let's see if it works, then you can fine tune it later. Exactly, exactly. That's the best thing. And I think that's also something. Like what we're talking about now, this is really at the forefront of what is happening right now in research, right? And so, realistically speaking, clinical applications, if uh, will probably only be there in like 10 years or something. So this is really right now at the moment where we we're trying to figure out, hey, there's this stuff out there, and this is really cool, but how can we reuse that for productive things? And so, the idea of this lecture is also a bit to Make you think about, you know, like what are the problems out there? You know, like, how could we think of cool ways to actually address this? Exactly. Yeah. Another one of my personal favorite was so uh, a group in Germany actually took capsaicin and its relevant, like related molecule called capsaicin. And so capsaicin is the spicy. Ingredient in the chili peppers. But that's the one that really makes you like throw flames. Um, turns out that this molecule is very important for, for nociception, so meaning the feeling of pain and heat. And so actually developing uh, blockers of that is important for anesthesia. For like painkillers like pain basically. And uh, so they they made a photo switchable variant of this capsaicin and capsaicin, and then used to probe like pain reception in uh, I think fish. But uh, the professor that, that uh, made that I think claims he also tried it himself and to see whether it's still spicy or not. <laughs> There are, other, there are many other fields where people uh, around the world are working on different problems now. Uh, one is tuberculosis. Uh, actually, I have been working on it, but also other groups in Spain and in, uh, in Germany have been working on beta blockers and uh, like the heart rate changing molecules. But that, the idea is then to use light to actually change the heart rate. Because, for example, the problem with uh, beta blockers is that they're very effective, but uh, people that take beta blockers kind of hit the glass ceiling at some point, like especially when they do sports, because beta blockers lower the heart rate. If you do a bit more sport, sporty activity, like your heart rate cannot go higher than a certain amount, and that can be annoying for people like, if they want to do, still be active. Um, so an idea would be like if you really have the potential to actually change the effect of the beta blocker in real time, that would really be helpful. Because then you could say, okay, now I really need the beta blocker, and then, for example, it can also be dangerous in the night, right? Because if, if it's already low, the heart rate, and then you rest and it gets even lower, then you can get to arrhythmias. And so that's also something that we have to do. Uh, diabetes is something where you could use light to, to, to make the cells in your body produce insulin, so you wouldn't have to inject it anymore. And uh, so this should be cancer. Now, this is all nice, but
coming back to light, uh, I have a small demonstration of the way it works. Oh, I, have, I also have a picture on the, the slide so that you can see. Uh, if I have my hand and the uh, flashlight, you will see that, that the only light that actually gets through my fingers is red light. And that has a very simple reason that UV light gets absorbed on the surface of our skin, whereas red light can actually go through. So the, that's, for example, the reason why we get sunburned, because only the outermost layer gets actually impacted with light. But then I've tried to draw that here. If you look at the different wavelengths and colors of light and look at how much it actually gets absorbed in the light, so how much gets taken up, is in the visible region almost everything gets taken up, but then at 650, 650 nanometers at red light, that's the, the hemoglobin, so the red, red stuff in our absorbs, and above that we have like a window where basically almost nothing absorbs, between 650 to 900 nanometers, this is like the red area of light, so that's why when I shine light, through my fingers, it gets red. Like that's why the red light is through. If you go above 900, you're getting into the vibration and, and uh, stuff. So that's when you start water heating up. And so that's not necessarily something you want to do again in patients, as mentioned before. And so if we think about useful photopharmacology in patients, we really ought to think about this phototherapy window. Because then we don't get stronger and we don't need the patient, but we have this effective window. And realistically speaking, uh, red light gets about two centimeters in our body. So everything that lies basically two centimeters within the skin is uh, feasible. And if you think about then diseases, it's really that different body parts. Of course, my at different places in our body, and it was more easily or more difficult to actually reach for that. And so, what we've done about three years ago, two years ago, was to actually come up with kind of a, like classification to think about more like in a framework about how different like uh, diseases could be treated. And for that, you can really have to think about like how we actually approach these different organs. Like, and so the most easy access would be just uh, skin and eyes, right? Because eyes are designed to pick up light. And just skin as well, for example, melanoma. Like skin cancer would be something that would be very easy to treat by light. But then, uh, then you can basically use any kind of openings that we already have, go in with a fiber optic, like with a cable that, that you know, brings light in. And you could that use, use that to then shine light on, for example, the, the intestines or like the lungs or whatever. Uh, what we then can do, and I've shown you the picture for photodynamic therapy, is just use a very small cut where we then can go in with a fiber optic cable to shine light in, in areas that are accessible through the skin. Uh, sorry. First clause three was uh, just basically this, this two centimeter layer. Clause four would be the small, small incisions or the small cut that we go in there and can reach areas that are deeper than these two centimeters for that one, I should say. And uh, last and most difficult part is something where we cannot just use a small incision, but we actually have to go through both. That would be the skull. Like, for example, if you think about the mouse, have to open the skull, or if you, for example, have bone marrow cancer, that's very difficult to read with light just because bones are not transparent to them. I was wondering on the intestines, could you, could you do something like a pill cam where you would, you know, went through the system and you kind of somehow turned it on when you got to the right spot? Oh, I, uh, yes, so actually people work on it. Oh, exactly. So. So there's different ways that people think about nanoparticles 
that they could use that then when they interact they generate light and that could be used as accurate so yeah. cool so, yeah. so the whole bit just attractively worked that way exactly so that that would be amazing. And uh, but there actually uh, there's this and I mentioned this field is currently like at the forefront, right? And so there's this active debate now in the field whether we really need these photohero people doing all these two centimeters, or whether we could just get away with using UV light. Because arguably you could also just use UV light, but then you just have to cut more. Yeah. And so that's something that the next five to ten years will show what should, what seems to be the most convenient and effective way. But because if you if you don't have very hard UV light in the UK, but like uh, soft UV light, then it's not so dangerous. Right? And it also depends whether you have an extremely strong light source or whether you have a very weak light source. And so that will be a question of engineering and, and fine tuning of the system. Unfortunately, if you look at our toolbox, so is that most often we're still restricted to UV light. And so an active push at the moment in chemistry is really to make uh, photo switches that are operated by, by red light. And there's now more and more examples where people have developed new variants of these photo switches within the red light. And interestingly, if you look at the one here, actually, that already uses naturally red light. That's actually where I've been on the issue. <laughs> uh, this is a new photo switch that was reported in 2014, so all people super excited. And yeah, so to sum up, is uh, uh, photopharmacology uses light to switch on and off medication. It has been only, it's like a new recent development. And I think there's still a lot of potential, and a lot of open questions, a lot of excitement. Uh, and I think uh, it really has the potential to change something. We just have to do that now. And to quickly go over it again, so we, we, we learned that geometry is important, that we can use light to change the geometry of the drug, so we can make it interact with enzymes and, and receptors. And we can use photo switches to mimic like natural processing in our eyes, and we can use that to do photocomputer. And so where are we right now? Where are we going to? Uh, as said, I think by now we just at that stage where there's a lot of first proof of principles within the last five years, and now we have this turning point where uh, we know now that it works in principle. Question is how do we make this step into the clinical and medical young? And so there's a lot of papers coming out at the moment, uh, but that report like uh, in vivo tests, so like tests in fish, in like mice and other organisms, where they can show really effective working. For example, just this month there's been a paper published on mice heart, where they can change the heart rates in living mice. And uh, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, there are at the moment some spin off companies that are formed in different countries that try to push this technology into the clinics. Uh, whether that will work, we'll find out. So, in the next five to ten, ten years, we'll, uh, we'll show the potential of this technology. But uh, even if it doesn't work out, I think I hope you learned something. And, uh, uh, I think, it, at least for me, I have always been amazed by how light uses stuff to interact with light and how we can learn from that and I think it's just very important. And with that I would like to thank you for your attention, thank Harvard, thank Simon News, thank you Ali for this opportunity and I'm um, open for questions. So. Yeah, um, a question a few slides back. You talked about like different lights act being the activator and sometimes you need UV and, and would infrared be the activator when a signal you goes to heat with that infrared yeah. actually infrared? Exactly. Yeah. So not the the heating infrared, but like the, just at the edge of like red light and the Oh okay. So like up to nine hundred.
people have taken advantage of fluorescent proteins to activate these molecules under certain conditions? Uh, there's people working on that right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what what she's talking about is really using like uh, like protein like molecules in our bodies, or that it could be bringing into our bodies that can when you shine light. It emits other other kind of light that you could use to switch on your drugs. And um, it's actually something that is uh, called heteromostics. Have you heard of that? So, It comes from therapeutics and uh, diagnosis. Right? And so the idea is to fuse, for example, if you go to the hospital to get an MRI, like, like the resonance like images or something, then sometimes they check your like contrast agents, which is just like making it they make it just basically nicer. And so the idea is then to use these diagnostic tools and change them in such a way that they can at the same time also do like a job. Like for example, you could fuse a photopharmacological drug to an antibody, like 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 basically uh, an address in a in the human body mail system that the drug gets delivered to a certain point, you could see it by a certain Tool in the clinics, and then you know, okay, this person has this and this disease, and then you can shine light, and then it gets that this disease gets solved, right? So that's a good idea. Actually, I can show us maybe like share a case study where this is actually very important. So, so I did my PhD in the Netherlands in Groningen, which is very much in the north, and so we're associated with the university hospital as well. And so what happens, for example, in cancer uh, treatment is that, let's say you have metastasis in, in, in your stomach or somewhere in your main part of your body. What happens is people have to cut you open and they have to remove the little tumors by single piece by piece. And so what happens at the moment is that the sur surgeons are trained to actually recognize these tumors themselves like by eye, and so it's just a lot of experience they have to have, and they cut it out. But you, they can make mistakes, right? And they can get some, and then you close it, close it, and then there's still stuff in there. It means if you run into complications, they have to open that again. Uh, so, what currently is being done is they actually have fluorescent dyes, which is like molecules that you can make bind to tumor cells, and then when you shine light, they light up. Literally, what happens at the moment is they, they open the cavity and they have a bucket full, four liters or like a gallon of like this, this warm solution with this uh, fluorent, uh, like with this lightning dye, and then they just flush the entire like open wound for like 20 minutes or so with this colorant. And what happens is then all the stuff that they have got uh, lights up and they shine light. So, so they get the obvious stuff first, exactly, and then they flush. Exactly. And now something you can imagine now if you then add like a photopharmacological drug to that dye, then it goes to the tumor. You can see, oh, there's still tumor. You cut it out, but then maybe stuff is all and you can still not see it or anything else like that. You could just think if you then have like a second solution with like a photopharma drug. And you can shine light before you close it. You can make sure that everything that's killed that you forgot or couldn't see, and then you definitely know like when you close it, everything is fine. So that's something like you could think about in a real world application. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, so yes. I was imagining like as a proof of concept that people put like VFP oh, exactly. in the mouth and then the imaging spectra can activate the drug. Uh, I, it's a good one actually. I, I haven't seen it yet. 